this is kind of an interesting pair of collections. We often teach these two together, stacks and queues. And uh, one of the things that makes stacks and queues interesting is that they aren't very powerful. I think when I show you grid, you can sort of understand, like, okay, I might want to store two-dimensional data. That's useful. When I show you vector, you say, okay, that's like an array list in Java. That stores a collection of elements. That seems useful. These ones are a tougher sell, and uh, I'll, I'll try to show you why. But I still think they're interesting to learn about. So just as a quick preview of what we're doing, stacks and queues are collections that store data in a sequence, a little bit like a, a vector. But a stack, we think of it as storing data in a vertical stack from bottom to top. And a queue is a little bit like a waiting line of people. You have a line of things from the back to the front. And they have a very limited set of access you can have to that data. And even though that's all they provide, they still are interesting and perform certain operations really quickly. So uh, let, me, let me show you a little bit more about them, and we'll kind of see why that those are useful. Now, remember we talked last lecture just at the very end. So I don't know, maybe you uh, didn't hear me talk about this very much. But we talked about this concept called an abstract data type. And I give you this example of the vector versus this other collection called the linked list. And I said they both implemented the same operations and uh, that they did it internally doing different things, you know, having different structure to the data, but they could do the same things. But some of them are faster for a vector and some of them are faster for a linked list. And the idea that you could implement something multiple ways like that is called an abstract data type. And when we talk about stacks and queues, I'm mostly going to talk about them from the perspective of using a library for a stack and a queue. Later on, you might want to know internally how they're written. So, um, I mean, I can teach you more about that later on as we go along. OK, so stacks. What's a stack? Well, it's a collection where you add things in, in a vertically stacked order, and the last thing that you put in is the first thing that would ever come back out. The only three operations you could do on a stack the only three canonical operations it has are what's called pushing, which means adding something to the top of the stack, or popping, which means removing the top thing from the stack, or you can sort of peek at the top and see what's there without removing it. But that's it. That's pretty much it. I mean, you can sometimes do a few other things like ask the size of the stack or ask if the stack is empty, but that's about all that it does. And so <laughs> your first reaction might be, wow, what a piece of crap, you know? That doesn't do very many things. I don't want that. I'll pass. Um, so, you know, there's lots of real world examples of stacks. You know, you come in and turn in exams and you stack them up. You put your new exam on top. You go to the cafeteria and there's a stack of trays and you grab the top one. And it's not very easy for you to reach into the middle or the bottom and grab something out of the middle because it's heavy and they're all stuck together. And so you kind of just grab the top one. And that's really the only one that you interact with, right? And if the, the you know, uh, dish room cleans some of the trays and has new trays, they bring them in and they just put them on the top of the stack. And so everything is happening on the top. There's lots of real world analogies like that. OK. Well, why would you want something like this? There are a lot of places where data naturally arranges itself in a stack-like way. So it's nice to have a structure that mirrors those examples. Um, <clears throat> when you have function calls in a program, function A calls B, which calls C, which calls D, and when each function is done, it returns to the place that it came from. And you've probably heard us talk about things like a function call stack. Maybe you've heard us use that term before. It's the idea that whenever we're done with the current function, we sort of pop it off of the top of our function call stack, and we return to the function that came before it. So a stack is a natural structure for representing calls like that. Also, if you're implementing a compiler for a programming language or an interpreter to execute code for a programming language, you often do expressions using stacks. As you see operators, you push and pop things to evaluate the, the results of a, a mathematical expression or a binary expression. Um, there's lots of cute example problems. I'll show you some of them today that you can solve using stacks. Stacks are good for flipping things around backwards or seeing whether things on one end match things on the other end and stuff like that. Um, there's also lots of interesting algorithms involving searching, searching through mazes, searching through data sets that involve pushing things. Um, my favorite example of a stack, which we won't explore today, is for implementing an undo feature. So if you have an app and you want to implement an undo, like if you hit Control Z or you click the undo uh, arrow on the menu, how does it do that? How does it keep track of that? Well, typically what you do in the app is you have some sort of representation of each action the user performed. Maybe they, if it's a Photoshop type of program, 
they, you know, they scribble with the brush, so you save that as an action. And then they resize the image, so you save that as an action. And what you do is you put all of the actions into some sort of stack internally inside of your program. And then if they click undo, you just go to the top one. That represents the most recent action that the user performed. And then you sort of do the opposite of that. You undo that to get the program, the, the picture, back to the state that it was in previously. So anyway, there's lots of examples where stacks are uh, used in computing. If you want to use a stack in this class in C++, we have this library called stack.h. So you can include stack.h in your program. Now you have access to create stack objects. And so you can construct a stack uh, using the brackets to indicate the type of data that it's going to store, just like a vector or any other collection. And then you can push things onto it. Now one thing that's a little confusing is when you print a stack you know, to see out or something like that, it doesn't print vertically. That might be what you would want. But instead, just to save lines, it prints horizontally. And so it prints from the bottom on the left to the top on the right. So um, just something to, to be aware of. So if you look at those examples, I'm sort of pushing things onto the end. It's a little bit like adding to the end of a vector, honestly. Well, then when you pop things off of the stack, it removes and returns the topmost element of the stack, or I guess in our output, the rightmost element of the stack. Now, if you peek, it just returns the topmost value without removing it. So if I peek here and then I pop here, the top of the stack is negative three both of those uh, two times. Does that make sense? OK. Now, stacks are not very powerful. That's about all that they provide. Sorry, let me go back just for one second. Those methods right there, that's it. That's all you get. <laughs> Push, pop, peek, those are the three things I said you had by default with a stack. There's also size and is empty. That's it. Now, um, if you think about it for a second, a really important piece of functionality that isn't there is the brackets. You know, to go to index i and grab the ith element out of the stack. Because we just don't use stacks in that way. You don't think of a stack as having indexes. I mean, yes, the elements have an ordering. 42 is on the bottom, 17 is on the top, and so on. So it's not that there's no order. It's just that we don't use int indexes to jump around and access them in some way like that. That's just not something this structure does. So you don't write for loops from zero to size and printing element i. You just don't do that with a stack. But you might say, well, <laughs> but I want to look at the stuff that's in the stack. I want to I loop over it. I want to process it, something like that, right? That's not what you do. You don't do it this way. Instead you do a <clears throat> while loop. As long as the stack isn't empty, you pull something off the stack by popping it, and then you do something with that element that you popped off. So it's like if I were going to grade all of your tests and I had a stack of them, I would pop each one off, put a big red slash through it and give you no points, and then go on to the next one. That's how I grade. So uh, <laughs> that's the kind of the way that you, that you process a, a stack, okay? And like I said, this one that I crossed out here, it doesn't even compile. It won't even let you. So it's not, it's not that I'm recommending that you don't use a for loop, but you just can't. OK, so that in mind, you see my little blue icon thingy, right? That means I'm going to ask you a, a Socratic question. So let's, let's set up for that. Um, let me finish my vote. By the way, if you ever don't get logged in at the start, uh, I pop it up again at the end of, of uh, lecture. So don't, don't worry. We're OK. OK, so let's do another question. And this one is going to be a quick question. It's multiple choice. OK, take a look at this code. Walk through that with me, or by yourself, I guess, <laughs> and uh, vote what you think the output of the code will be. I'll give you a minute. Please feel free to talk to your, your neighbor if you want to.
Ready for me to show the, the votes yet? No? You need a minute? It's cool. I can wait. Okay, it looks like most of you have cast your vote now. So if you haven't voted, give me a vote real quick, and then we'll pop it up. <coughs> what do we got? A lot of Ds here. So 82% D. Let's see. Do I agree with you? D. So 10, 10. You peek at the top, which is a 10, but it doesn't remove it. Then you pop it. So that's still the 10, but this one removes it now, right? So after this line, it's only got a 7. Okay, then I push a 3 and a 5. So now it's 7, 3, 5. I pop, and that's going to be the 5. I ask for the size. It was 7, 3, 5. Now it's just 7, 3, so the size is 2. I peek, and this, the 3 is on the top, yeah. I push 8, so now it's 7, 3, 8, right? And I pop, pop, so it's going to be 8 and then 3. Yeah, yeah, that looks great. So, yeah, that's the answer to that one. That one's a D. Okay, well, let's, let's write some code together that uses stacks. Now, this is an interesting example where stacks come in handy. Um, you can use stacks to check for the matching of things or the balance of things. I, I like it. Um, and like, for example, you can do uh, matching opening parentheses with closing parentheses or opening curly braces with closing curly braces. So, for example, if I have pieces of, like, a pretend source code, like these strings right here, Maybe I want to know that every time I open a parenthesis, I close it. Maybe every time I open a curly brace, I want to close it. And not just, I don't just want to know that there's three of these and there's three of those. I don't just want that. I also want the order of the nesting to be right. So for example, here I open a parenthesis, but I close a curly first. So do you understand that that's got to be a mistake, an error, right? Also like here, I've got one closing, or yeah, one closing curly and one opening curly. So those like match in terms of the count, but that's not in the right order. This is closing something and nothing was open. So that's a problem too. So what I want is to write a function with you guys called check balance that takes a string as a parameter and the string represents code like this. And we're gonna somehow use a stack to help us figure out whether it has balance between the parentheses and also the, the curly braces. And what the function will do is it will return the index in the string where there is an error first. Or if there are no errors, uh, it'll return negative one to indicate that the string is balanced. OK? I will help you. I will do the hard part. You ready? OK, the hard part is I will write the heading of the function for you. There. OK, wait. I'm, I'm really nice. I don't want anybody to ever accuse me of not loving you guys. So how about I'll do this for you, too. For int i equals 0, i is less than the string's length i++. plus plus. OK, I, I gave you a lot there. <laughs> All I need is the rest. So <clears throat> that's what we're supposed to do. I'm teaching you about stacks. How do you think a stack might help us to solve this problem? Any ideas? What do you think? You have like a you have the first parenthesis, then you will add one to the stack, and if you have like a closed one, then you will pop one from the stack. Okay. He says when I see like opening parentheses, I add things to the stack, and when I see closing parentheses, I remove things from the stack. That's a great idea. When you say add to the stack, do you what do you want me to add exactly? Like. A, a counter or a number or a character or what do you want me to put in the stack? I guess it doesn't matter. Just, just keep adding one. 
Okay, yeah, so you said it doesn't really matter. I guess the one thing where it might matter is like, I don't want to close a curly when I opened a parenthesis. So I need to know that not just the count kind of of how many, but also maybe what kind they are. So maybe we could just push the characters themselves into a stack. So like, as I see parentheses, I will stack them up into a stack of parentheses or something like that. Okay, so you're saying like if, uh, so the character at index i is called code bracket i, right? And maybe just, I'm probably gonna refer to that a lot. So why don't I say like care c equals that, okay? So if the character c is a opening parenthesis or it's an opening curly, you want me to push it into a stack. We don't have one yet, so I can go up here and make one. Let's make a stack of characters called uh, S, you can call it whatever you want. So you say S dot push, and you want me to put C onto the stack? Okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> now what, so you're saying if I see closing characters, I wanna remove things from the stack? So like you're saying else, if uh, C is a closing parenthesis or C is a closing curly, I want to do S dot pop, something like that. I think that's a good start, but we need a little more, a little more than that. What were you going to say? Yeah. Um, if uh, if S is empty and you try to pop something from it, what happens? If S is empty, the stack is empty, and we try to pop out of it, what will happen? That's what will happen. It will explode. It will uh, crash. The program will throw an exception. So we don't want that, right? So then we need to check before that other, uh, so I guess, or in, in the that else if statement, if, if C is a one of the two hybrid closing parentheses and not empty. Okay, right. So there's a couple of things. Like, I think when you see an opening parenthesis or opening curly, you just put them into the stack. That, that part, I think, is pretty good code so far. When we see closing parentheses and curlies, there's a couple things we want to look at. If we see a closing curly, we probably want to look at what's in the stack right now, right? Like, so if you look at uh, the second call here, see this red closing curly that I'm spinning my cursor around right there? What would be on the top of the stack at that moment when we saw that curly? Wouldn't it be this opening parenthesis? So we could probably compare those two to see if they matched up with each other, right? And that would tell us that would be an error at that place in the string if those didn't match, right? So what if I said, like, maybe I'll separate these two cases out. If it's a closing parenthesis, and if what's on top of S, I want to look at what's on top of S without... Um, removing it. So how about if I peek at what's on top of S? If that isn't uh, opening parenthesis, that's an error, right? What are we supposed to do when we find errors? Do you remember? Return. Right, return. <laughs> We're supposed to say what index an error is at, and that index would be index I, right, where we are at at this place in the code. So that's an error case. Um, okay, well, maybe, what, maybe I'll reverse this. I'll say if what's on top of the stack is a per, an opening parenthesis, that's a good thing, right? If what's on top of the stack is an opening parenthesis, that just means they match, and so what should I do? Probably pop off that uh, opening parenthesis, because I saw the match for it, so they, they consume each other, and I throw them both out, kind of. Otherwise, this means I have an error here, right? And so I think you could have a similar piece of code like this, but it's about curlies. You say, well, if it's a closing curly and what's on top is not an opening curly, that could be an error. We could talk about redundancy in a second. Maybe we think this code is redundant. But, okay, now you, though, brought up a good question. You said, what if I see a closing curly and there's just nothing at all on the stack? What will happen? So there's, a, there's an example right here, the third call. We open a parenthesis while true, we close it. So after that, there's nothing on the stack. We open a parenthesis, we close it. Now there's nothing on the stack. And then we see a closing curly. So that's an example where we would get to this place in the code with an empty stack. And if you try to peek or pop an empty stack, that would crash. So maybe what I'll do is I'll say there's two ways you can have an error. Let me, let me flip this back again. I had it flipped, and I flipped it, and I'll flip it again. Uh, paste, paste, uh, paste, and paste. So 
there's two ways you can have an error. If the stack is empty or what's peaked out of it is wrong, those are both errors, right? And you know, uh, it sh does this short-circuited checking where if the first one fails, it's enough to stop so it won't fall off the cliff and do the second one and crash. So that'll be okay. So we could do the same thing down here. And just, you know, in terms of these lines being redundant, I think we could make a helping function to scrape that redundancy out. But I want to just focus on the stack parts for now. Okay, now, if we get all the way down to the end of this for loop, we get all the way through the for loop and we never returned anything, what does that mean about the string that we're looking at? I mean, we didn't find the errors, there weren't any problems with it. So it's probably balanced, right? I think the description of our problem said if it's not balanced, or if it, if there, if it is balanced, if there are no errors, we should just return negative one. Because it's returning the index that the problem is at. There's no problem. So return negative one, right? OK, let's try it. Let's test it out. I've written a main that calls it a couple times and prints the result. So we, we can just see. OK, what do we got? Uh, this one here did the right thing. The error was at index 14, which I think is here. This one here, it thinks the, in, the error is at index 20, which, what is that? Is that this closing curly right before that? Then this one here, we said there was no error with this string. So the string is if x opening curly. But there is an error with that string. Do you understand what the error is? The curly's never closed. So I think we made an assumption that was too simple at the end of our code. We assumed if we got down here, no errors had been found, therefore the string was valid. But really, only sometimes is that true, right? If you get down here, there are some cases where it could still be an error. How would you tell if there was an error down at this point in the code? Yes? Right, if the stack's empty, everything matched with everything and we're fine. So if the stack is empty, then it's a negative one. Else. There is an error. We're supposed to return an int for where the error occurred. I think the spec of the function says, if something's never closed, return the string's length. So the error is like at the end of the string. That's just, you know, whoever specifies this problem says that we want, they want us to return that. So otherwise, let's return the code string's length. OK, let's see if that passes all of our tests. Uh, fail. So why does this fail? Oh, you know what? I think the reason is because that's actually an error in my test. I think <laughs> it's okay. Down in main, I think I wrote that it should be index 8. But I think the error here is index uh, 7. So, right, because uh, there is an error and it's this that there's nothing open for that. So, yeah, I think our code works for all the example calls now. <laughs> so, anyway, that's an example of a function that interacts with a stack or uses a stack to help solve a problem. Now, look, if you're a cynic, you might say, I don't need a stack to solve this problem. I could have just used a vector. I hate you, Marty. And I'd say, geez, that's an overreaction. Well, but like, it's a reasonable criticism. Like, I don't know if I need this thing. A vector is just as good. I could have done the same sort of stuff with a, with a vector. Why would I want a stack? Well, uh, let's see. I'll get to that in a second. I guess what I would say is, even though a stack doesn't do very many things, what it does do, it does efficiently. It doesn't use very much memory. It doesn't take very much runtime to do the things that it does. A vector has more powerful methods, but some of them are slow. We talked about shifting and moving things around. Some operations on a vector can be slow. And so this thing does few things, but it does them well. And that's a good thing. Also, I think some problems, it's nice to visualize them as stacking things up. It's just a, your code sort of mirrors this mental image you have for the problem that you're solving. Vector does less of that maybe in this case. So I guess that's the sales pitch for the stack, even though it's less powerful than a vector. Um, here is an example. This is listed as being a Socrative problem, but for time purposes, I just want to ask the room and we just discuss. Here is a function I've written called largest. It takes a stack parameter. And the goal of this function is to tell me what is the largest value in the stack. Let's assume the stack is not empty. And so my question is, what's wrong with this function? I guess I have some multiple choices down there, but what's wrong with the function's code? Somebody raise your hand and let me know what you think. So I've got 
I've called you once or twice. Maybe I'll get somebody else for this one. Sorry. <coughs> Don't vote. I just want you to talk to me. <laughs> Raise your hand, someone. What do you think? She's exactly right. She said it does return the right value as long as the stack isn't empty to begin with, which we're assuming. But like you said, it destroys the contents of the stack in order to figure out the answer, right? My analogy would be like, you know, if you ask me like, uh, you know, which student in the room has the biggest brain? And I had to saw your heads open to look and see. And I said, it's her right there, the one on the floor bleeding to death. <laughs> Maybe I should pick a different analogy. <laughs> uh, right, it's like, it's like if I said, hey, I've got a stack of plates here. How many plates are there in the stack? And I picked them up and I said, one. I throw it over my head, ksh, it breaks, two, ksh, three. There were 74 plates. <laughs> and now we have a bunch of glass, you know, porcelain shards uh, on the floor. And it's like, well, great, I had 74 plates, but now they're all ruined. Um, this code tells you the biggest value in the stack, and then the stack is gone when it's done, right? So that's too bad. This raises interesting questions about like, when you call a function and you pass in a collection to the function, are you allowing that function to make changes to your collection? Do you want to allow the function to make changes to your collection? You'll notice that the thing is passed by reference, right? It has an ampersand. That means it's being shared between main and this function. So if I change it here, main will see those changes. One way of making this code not destroy the stack would be to just delete that ampersand, which would cause the stack to be copied, and then the copy would be destroyed, which would not change the original one, right? Are there any other ways you could avoid the destruction of the stack but still answer the question? Yeah. Very stack and pass each, or push each thing as you pop it into the temp and then push it back into the iterate through that and push it back into the uh, full swing. Right. So you could also create a backup stack, a temporary stack, and you could put the data in there temporarily until you're done and then put the data back. Or you could just copy the original data into the second one and use the second one for all your uh, destructive operations. So sometimes that's something you want to watch out for. You want your function not to damage the data being passed to it. So this is something to be aware of. OK. Any other questions about stacks before I talk about queues? Yes, sir? Aren't these solutions instead of? Which is better, to remove the ampersand or to um, do a backup? Well, I would say if you had full control over the code, in this particular example, just removing the ampersand would be better. But sometimes what happens is you, for some reason, have to write the function with a certain header because of a constraint that I put on you, or the assignment put on you, or your boss puts on you. So you have to take it by reference for some reason. But you still don't want to destroy it. So sometimes you don't get to choose. And therefore, I wanted to mention both the options as things that you can use to get around this issue. They're both useful at certain times. OK. Let's talk about queues. A queue is basically like a waiting line. If you go to, to get lunch and you have to wait in line to place your order, you stand at the back and you wait until you get to the front. And when you get to the front, you get processed. So that's the idea of this data structure. You can think of it as a, as a chain of, of, of elements of data. And when you add things to a queue, we call that enqueuing. You enqueue at the back. And <clears throat> when you want to remove something from a queue, you, that's called dequeuing. You dequeue from the front. So if you add you know, things to the queue, they come out in the same order that they were added. First come, first serve, right? You get in line first, you get served first. That's the idea of this structure. So the basic operations supported are basically add, remove, and peak, which we call NQ, DQ, and peak. And um, <clears throat> OK, again, this is another one of those simple structures that you could just use a vector instead, and it would work fine. But if you think about it for a second, you know, adding at the back of a vector and removing from the front of a vector, removing from the front of a vector is kind of slow. You have to shift everybody, right? So vectors can be a little slower than this guy for the same sorts of operations. Lots of tasks that you might do in programming have data that you may want to represent naturally as a queue. One would be like if, you have a, if you're writing the software to manage a printer. The printer has uh, jobs that are queued up because it can't spit the pages out as fast as the jobs come in. 
So it stores those jobs in a queue. It pulls the next job off the front of the queue. All kinds of examples like that, queues of processes and packets to, to process, that sort of thing. Um, plus lots of real world applications like a waiting line uh, for customers to be served, right? Okay, so those are examples where you might use something like a queue. In our library, there is a queue class. You include queue.h. So you get all those methods I talked about. You get nq, dq, peak, size, and empty. That's very similar to the, the five methods that you get with a stack. I've got another example for you. Um, the queue, when you print it out on the screen, the front is on the left and the back is on the right. So you add three things. You have four th neg 42, negative 3, and 17. If you dq, the one from the front comes out, the 42. You peek, you look at the one at the front without deleting it. So then I dq again and the negative 3 comes out and only the 17 uh, is left, right? Okay, and just like with stacks, you can't do int i with brackets for indexing to reach into a queue. You can only add at the back and you can only remove at the front. That's all it lets you do. The brackets don't work. So with that in mind, you see I've got another little blue icon. So I am going to ask you this Socrative question again. So let's jump into that. Let's do another multiple choice. Okay, here goes. So it's a piece of code that adds the elements one through six into a queue. One's at the front, six is at the back. And then I run this code on it, and there's some print statements here. What is the, wait, where are the choices? Oh, <laughs> why, why does it do that? Uh, which, which of those four choices do you think is the output from this, uh, from this code? Take a look. One more time, or are you guys okay? Let's see what you guys are voting for. Cast a vote now if you haven't voted yet. What do you think the answer is? Oh, it's all over the place. I love it. And the votes are still pouring in. You got no idea, do you? <laughs> Lol. <laughs> what does that even mean? There's no E. There's no E. <laughs> I can interpret E to mean whatever I want. So you know what? Let's see. E, Marty, is super awesome and cool. All right. Well, if that's what you want to vote for, then... Wait, only 2% of you think that. Oh. Uh, okay, there's a big split here. A and B both got a lot of votes, and both of the other choices also received non-trivial representation. So... I guess if you look at A, if you chose A, what I think you're assuming is that this loop removes and prints every element, and then at the end here in the last line, there's nothing left, right? And if you chose B, you're sort of thinking this thing took out half of the contents and not the other half. So, I mean, which one is it? Somebody who f really feels like they, they know why their answer is right, do you want to try to justify your answer? Um, which one did you pick and why? Big B, why? Um, so I said that at the end of each loop, Q size updates. So first I is zero, Q size is six. And so it prints out one, and then I is two, and Q size is five. So it prints out two, and then three, and two more, so it prints out three, and then four. Yeah. OK, I want to walk through this, because it's important. So. Um, Here's that same slide. Let's see. I, I can't draw on it unless. OK, there. You guys read that OK? So there's the slide. So she said it just right. Int i starts at 0. And the q size is 6, right? 
right? So what I do is I do a DQ operation, so that removes the first element, and it prints it. So it prints the one, fine. Now we loop, we wrap around our, our loop and we repeat. So now after that, int i increases up to one, right? But remember, hey, the moment we did that DQ operation, that shrunk the Q by one. That changed the size of the Q. So Q dot size is now five. And I hope you understand that when you have a for loop, every time it goes back up, it checks the test condition again, including if it has to call for the size, it asks for the size again. So now it says, oh, well, zero was less than six. Is one less than five? Yes. So the loop goes again. It prints dq, so it prints the two. And then it does another i++, plus plus, so i becomes two. And the dq operation reduced the q size to four. Is two less than four? Yes. So it runs the loop again. q.dq gets printed. So that prints the three. And then that does i++, plus plus, which makes a three here. Then we do the Q size got decreased by the, the, the DQ operation here. So this one becomes three. So both of these things are at three right now. Is I less than Q size? Not anymore, they're the same. So that's a, a, a trick, right? That I's going up and the Q size is going down and eventually they cross in the middle. So the net result of this piece of code is that it prints half the elements and then it stops the loop. And then that means one, two, three get printed. And after that in, curly braces, the four, five, six are still left in the queue at the, at the end with size three. So, I mean, I was kind of trying to trick you there, but I wanted to walk through that and see when you loop over a structure and the size is changing, that can mess with the number of times the loop repeats for, okay? So if you wanted to change it so that the answer was A, how could you change the code on the slide to achieve that? Q size plus just say okay. i less than q size plus three or something like that. Yeah, that sounds, I mean, that would work, but I think it's a little bit hacky, right? Like, are there, did you have another answer? I think you could write an integer size equals q dot size before the for loop and then the themselves i less than size. Right, what she said is um, you've got this right here, and you're saying the problem is that the size keeps changing. I do want it to loop six times, which is the original size of the queue. You're saying, why don't I just save this as int size equals that, and then just do i less than size, which will always be that variable of six, and that won't go down as q dot size goes down. That's a great way to fix it. Yeah. Are there any other ways you could fix this same piece of code? What were you going to say? Um, if you start in i minus one, no, yeah, you said minus one, and then loop while i is greater than your Oh, sure, count down. Okay, sure. So you're saying int, int i equals q dot size minus one, and then i is what, greater than or equal to zero? Yeah. yeah, we saw that trick last time, right? To go count down, go backwards. That, I think that works too, because we only grab the size once and we don't care what it is anytime after that, right? Okay, great. Are there any other ways you could fix this? What do you think? Uh, do a while loop and do is not I also like that a lot. How about while, wily, wily coyote, uh, while the queue isn't empty. That works really well, too. All of those are good solutions to this particular problem. And actually, this third one may be the most, what I would call, idiomatic of all three. That's most typical of how queues are expected to be used. But all three of the answers you gave are, are perfectly valid ways of solving it. I think the, the first guy was saying something like maybe go up to like, you know, q dot size plus three or q dot size times two, like if that would actually solve the problem as well. So there's lots of ways you could get this to produce the right behavior that we were hoping for if you wanted the answer to be A. Okay? I'm just pointing this out. I'm going to remind you in about a week because a lot of you are going to basically do this on your homework. <laughs> You're going to write some code like this without realizing it and the output's going to be B, and you're going to be surprised that it isn't A, and I'm going to be like, remember that slide I was reminding you about? And you won't remember. So, okay, I'm just talking. But I'll have a good laugh with my fiancé about it. By the way, I, I texted her while you guys were looking at this, and I'm like, they're doing a Socrative right now. Love you, kiss, you know. And then she goes, vote B. And it's like actually the right answer. I was like, oh, she knew. <laughs> She's good. She's a smart one. Um, I think she might have guessed, though. Anyway, so, yeah, um, these are two patterns I want you to be aware of because they're useful. 
in many situations. So instead of for loop, maybe you want a while not empty loop. Maybe that's the pattern you want. Or the other suggestion is maybe saving the size as a variable so that changing the size won't mess up your loop. That might be something that you, that you want to do. So keep those both in mind as problem solving strategies when you're working with queues. Stacks as well. Sometimes with stacks you want the same idea. Okay. <clears throat> you can mix stacks and queues. Sometimes you have a queue and you put three things into it. Then you make a stack and you dump the contents of the queue into the stack. So you have one, two, three in the queue. You pull off the one, you pull off the two, you pull off the three. You put each one into a stack. So now you have one, two, three. So three is on the top of the stack, right? And now while the stack is not empty, you pop the things off and enqueue them. So you enqueue the three, then you enqueue the two, then you enqueue the one. And the end result, when you print the queue at the end, you've reversed the queue. Do you see that? Queues don't have a reverse method, but dumping things into a stack and then pulling them back out gets them back out in the opposite order that you, what you put them in. That's kind of a cute trick. Stacks are good for reversing things. So let's do a couple quickie problems together as a team. Let's write some code. I want to write a function called stutter where you pass in a queue, and you'll get two copies of every element of the queue. So if you start with one, two, three, you get one, one, two, two, three, three. Okay. So let's go. Let's go do that real quick. Uh, where is it? It's called stutter. I've got a file called queues.cpp. I think I have to rename this main to main two, so it won't run this one. So go to my queue file. Hope I did I remove the code out of here? Uh, okay, I want to write stutter. So wait, do I have stutter in here? Stutter. No, okay, that's okay. We can handle this. So let's rename this to main. And we're going to write stutter, void stutter, and we take a queue of what? Integers? A queue of integers. Yeah, a queue of ints named queue. Okay. Okay. So again, like I want like one, two, three to become one, one, two, two, three, three. What do you think? I'll create a new queue of int and then do uh, <coughs> and then do a while the queue is not empty. And then I would do Q2, and then in Q, uh, no, wait, outset, create an int, and equals Q dot DQ. Okay, pull each element out. And then uh, in Q, and twice. Okay, sure, we can do that. And then when we're done, Q2 has the results we want. I really want the results to be in this guy Q, though. Right now, Q has been emptied out. So you can say Q equals Q2. That will copy the contents of Q2 into Q. This is a correct solution. Can you tell me how to solve it without a temporary second data structure? Can you solve it just using the, the one Q that we were given? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, you want to use a for loop. You can do it by taking an integer of the size of the integer. Okay, int size equals two dot size. You want to capture that as a variable. Then you want to for loop up to size, i equals zero to size. Okay, and what do you want to do in here? And then something kind of like this. Yeah, basically. Okay, but we don't have a q two. So where do you want to? Just do q dot. Yeah, so this is a really nice solution as well. Pull one person off the front and re-add that same person twice in the back. And so the queue is sort of morphing as we go along. But the reason, I think it's important to do what he said to do, which is save the size as a variable, because otherwise your size is growing as you're looping, you're adding to the queue, and I think your loop might never stop, because you're looping up to a size that's growing. You know, So this is really important to make sure you loop up to the original size of the, of the queue to get the result you want. Does that make sense? Those are both correct solutions. I prefer, in general, the ones that have fewer auxiliary data structures, but this one totally works, too. Sometimes you have to watch out. Sometimes the problem statement will say you're not allowed to use any other structures. So in that case, this solution might be banned or something for that example. Let's do one more. We've got a couple minutes left. I want to write a function called mirror. You pass in a queue of strings, 
and it modifies the queue's state to store its original state plus its self-reversed. ABC becomes ABCCBA, like on the slide there. Okay? So if I go up here, here's this mirror function. Let's write it. You are allowed to use an auxiliary structure here. Can you think of any structures that might be helpful? Stack, okay. You guessed it. Uh, Sack string S. Okay, what do you want to do with S? So if I put everything from Q into S and then back again, I'll get CBA. But I don't want to lose the ABC. Do the same trick. Okay, so int size equals Q size. And then a for loop up to that. And then what? I'm pulling elements off, like string temp equals q dot dq. And then what am I doing with it? Put it in the stack, s dot push the string temp. OK. And then down here, while the stack isn't empty, put in the q the things that were in the stack, q dot nq, what you get from s dot pop. Pop. That's close, but I think it's missing something. Do you know uh, in the back? Yeah. We're, yes. Um, you need to uh, compute what you put into the stack uh, back into the original queue. Like that? Yeah. yeah, so pull each one out, put it back into the queue, and also add it to the stack. So after that loop is done, the queue will be back to its original state, and the stack will also have the elements A, B, C. And then if we pop those out, C, B, A, those should get back into the Q at the end. So A, B, C, C, B, A comes out at the end.